Will you join me in the spirit of prayer? God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to hear your words and to listen for your word. I ask that you make your presence known among us this morning, that you whisper in our ears, that you touch our hearts, that we might receive even just a fraction of the message you have for us this morning. Amen. Jesus keeps trying to escape notice. In the gospel text two weeks ago, he traveled to the region of Tyre and then to the Decapolis. In this week's text, he's back in his home territory of Galilee, but he did not want anyone to know it. The reason he did not want anyone to know of his presence was because he had some critical teaching to do with his disciples. Some very important things have happened in the meantime. Jesus has been teaching his disciples about what awaits him in Jerusalem and about the cost of following him. Jesus has been transfigured on a mountain before Peter, James, and John, appearing in dazzling white clothes, conversing with Moses and Elijah. Jesus has told his disciples that Elijah has already come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, referring to the death of John the Baptist and clearly implying that he himself is the one for whom Elijah had prepared the way. And he has cast out a demon from a boy that his disciples were not able to heal. Now, passing through Galilee, Jesus tries to escape notice while he continues teaching his disciples. The obtuseness of the disciples in Mark's gospel is downright comical at the same time that it is deadly serious. In spite of all they have witnessed and heard from Jesus, they still do not seem to have a clue as to what his mission is about. Jesus announces once again what is to happen to him in the near future. The Son of Man is to to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. Yet the disciples still do not understand. And what is more and what is worse, they are afraid to ask any questions. Perhaps they do not want to understand this confusing message about a Messiah who suffers and dies. Or perhaps they are afraid to reveal their ignorance. Maybe they remember the rebuke Peter received at Caesarea Philippi and wanted to avoid similar humiliation. In any case, their fear of asking questions mean that they stay in their state of ignorance and confusion. Instead of asking questions of Jesus, the disciples turn to arguing with each other. When they arrive in Capernaum, Jesus asks what they were arguing about along the way, and they are silent. Too embarrassed to admit that they had been arguing with each other about who was the greatest among them. Jesus, of course, knows exactly what they've been discussing and tries once again to teach them that the reign of God reverses the world's ideas of greatness. True greatness, Jesus says, is not to be above others, but to be the least of all and the servant of all. It is not to ascend the social ladder, but rather descend it, taking the lowest place. It is not to seek the company of the powerful, but to welcome and care for those without status, such as the child that Jesus embraces and places before his disciples. In any culture, children are vulnerable, dependent on others for their survival and their well-being. In the ancient world, their vulnerability was magnified by the fact that they had no legal protection. A child had no status, no rights. A child certainly had nothing to offer anyone in terms of honor or status. But it is precisely these little ones with whom Jesus identifies. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. While we cannot know with any certainty what the disciples would have asked, 
if they had dared to ask questions. It seems likely, given what Jesus has just announced about his impending suffering and death, that they would have wanted to know why the Messiah must suffer and die. Not only was this idea completely foreign to Jewish messianic expectations, it was essentially threatening for those closest to Jesus. Christian theology has attempted to provide explanations for the why, and certain of these explanations have been read back into the gospel texts. But the fact is, Jesus does not explain the why. We can only deduce the why in reading the gospel narrative. In this narrative, Jesus arrives proclaiming that the region of God has come near, calling for repentance, healing diseases, and forgiving sins. Throughout his ministry, he associates with the last and the least in society, Gentile women, bleeding women, lepers, tax collectors, and other notorious sinners. He even welcomes and makes time for little children, much to the disciples' upset. For all of this, he is condemned as an outlaw and a blasphemer by the religious authorities who decide that he is too dangerous and must be eliminated. Here it is important to emphasize that Jesus does not die in order for God to be gracious and to forgive sins. Jesus died because he declares the forgiveness of sins. Jesus dies because he associates with the impure and the worst of sinners. Jesus dies because the religious establishment cannot tolerate the radical grace of God that Jesus proclaims and lives. This week's epistle reading explicitly connects James's interest in mindful speech with his concern for community harmony. James has already addressed the right use of communication, and this consistent emphasis on ordering our communication to knit us more closely to others rather than to alienate finds its goal in a passage that spells out James's call to live a life of integrated spirituality with words, actions, and sentiments that all correspond with the character of God. James signals his concern about community harmony with the question in the beginning. These conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Here, James takes it for granted that his listeners experience dissension. Although this may be a strictly hypothetical query based on general experience, when it is read beside other passages in James, one gets the sense that the letter envisions a congregation in which richer and poorer participants find themselves at odds. Thus, in the second chapter, James cautions the community against favoring the wealthy members and disregarding the poor, while the rich members oppress you, drag you into court, and blaspheme the excellent name of God. James clearly sympathizes with the poor in this situation. They have been chosen by God to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, whereas James exhorts the wealthy to weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to them. James's warnings against boasting and in favor of lowliness resonate with this concern as well. Since James does not describe any specific persons or incidents, we ought not assert too de definite a setting for these cautions, but they would fit perfectly in a situation in which wealthy members of the congregation were exercising their social power and riches in order to dominate poorer members. To such circumstances, James articulates a forceful rebuttal with scriptural warrants and dire warnings. The reading begins with the tribute of peacefulness. James uses these verses to bind together claims to be wise with the stipulation that wisdom reveals itself in action just as faith does. James binds true wisdom to peaceable behavior and willingness to yield. Belligerence and contentiousness demonstrate a worthy determination to win rather than a faithful determination to build up harmony, gentleness, and mercy. 
Would James suggest that disciples stand idly by while evildoers perpetrate wrongs as slavery, such as slavery or genocide? Clearly not, since he himself condemns the sins he sees afflicting his neighbors. But James emphatically does not justify the use of violence in support of godly purposes. Like Jesus and Paul, James rejects the use of unholy means to attend, attain allegedly good ends. Instead, James articulates a theology that refuses to sacrifice the personal righteousness that a disciple manifests in honesty, mercy, and faithful trust in God. Indeed, James warns that our struggles to prevail in a worldly conflict lock our loyalties to the sinful structures themselves, engendering self-congratulatory satisfaction with a world that is passing away. But naming the truth isn't being merely passive, and refusing to litigate or win isn't a counsel of despair or complacency. Truth-telling entails acknowledging our own frailty and failability as integral aspects of identifying and condemning others' misconduct. In the context of James' theology of integrity, the exercise of coercion in itself falsifies the claims that one is representing God's will. The violent compulsion to, attend vic to attain victory over adversaries very quickly entangles us in lies, brutality, self-excusing rationalization, and the boastful sense that God is on our side against their side. One may not be rich or important in the world's eyes, but everyone has the capacity to adhere to truthfulness, peaceableness, and mercy. Our refusal to stoop to the violence that categorizes our oppressors, though, aligns us with God's own power, and our willingness to endure hardship rather than shed blood or pass judgment aligns us with prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. The radical grace of God that Jesus proclaims and lives completely obliterates the world's notions of greatness based on status, wealth, and achievement. Perhaps that is one reason we resist grace so much. It's much more appealing to be great on the world's terms than on Jesus' terms. Greatness on Jesus' terms means being humble, lowly, and vulnerable as a child. Greatness on Jesus' terms is risky. It can even get a person killed. But as Jesus teaches repeatedly, his way of greatness is also the path of life. And thanks be to God for that. Amen.